Today, I want to talk again about stewardship. Now, I told you that God gave me two words at the end of 2022, and he said they are going to be for 2023, and the two words were stewarding abundance. And I've even asked the preaching team to seek God on this topic the next several weeks because I want to see what all God is wanting to say to us. See, there's something that God has on his heart, and we need to have on our heart what God has on his heart. So we're going to be pressing in for that. But if you only get one thing, just one single thing, I want you to get this, and I want you to get it really clearly. Stewardship is not, it's not about giving. It's about living. See, it's not just about giving. It's about how you live. I heard God say that to me loud and clear. I was walking around my house on Friday, and he said, when you say on Sunday, I'm going to talk about stewardship, people in the congregation are going to think, oh, they're trying to raise money. Oh, they want us to give more. But that's so far from the point. I don't yet know what all God wants to say. He just said stewarding abundance. I'm still waiting to see the full picture of that. But the miserly, poverty mentality, tight-fisted, lack-minded, semi-religious version of stewardship is, oh, they want me to give money. But see, stewardship is not just about that at all. It's really about a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. And even more than that, it's an identity. It's an identity. How can you act like you're supposed to act if you don't know who you are? <laughs> if you don't understand what your role is in a company and your boss comes to you and he goes, well, you're not doing the right job. And you go, well, oh, well, I didn't know that was who I was supposed to be. I, I just thought I could do anything I wanted here. And he goes, no, you are called this and I want this, I expect this product from you, this, for you to do this function. If you don't know what your role is in a play, you'll be saying somebody else's lines. <laughs> if you don't know what your role is in a church, you'll be trying to tell the pastor what to do. And so, <laughs> and so, you know, if you don't know who you are, you won't know how to act. And stewardship is not about giving. It's about living. It's actually an identity because there's so many scriptures in the word about stewardship. And so we don't want you confused. And I want to see what all God has to say. Success, we've said many times, is knowing the will of God for your life and doing it fully. Now, the definition of steward in the Bible lends itself to the idea of an overseer or a manager over someone else's matters. The Bible has many mentions of the word steward. Uh, the steward basically works for the owner in the owner's absence. There's hundreds of scripture references that allude to this principle. Every king in the Bible was a steward. The Hebrew kings didn't rule in their own right or for their own designs or desires. They didn't even rule just for the people that they served, that had chosen them. But they really were acting equal parts as servant to and representative of Jehovah, the true king of Israel. Miriam, like John preached last week, unwittingly was stewarding Moses when she found him in the basket and raised him for God, without even realizing it, she was stewarding for God. Then Moses himself became a steward for Pharaoh. But the number one hindrance to being a faithful and good steward as Christians today is not recognizing one simple but profound fact. One profound fact. You've got it. This is the foundation. Everything belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Now we go, right, yes, we give lip service to that, but do we act like that? Everything belongs to God. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. See, and you'll go, well, the 10% belongs to God. Now, I don't even give the 10%, some people might say, but I know it belongs to God, but I'm, I, you know, I, you know eating out has gotten expensive, and if I, if I give that tithe money, I, I can't eat out as often. If I give that tithe money, I can't buy that new outfit that I wanted. If I give that tithe money, I can't buy the expensive car. i got to buy the more moderate car. And so some people, they, they say everything belongs to God, but they don't even give them the 10%. And so you need to start there. But let me be clear, not just the 10% belongs to God. The whole 100 does. And so I know people who tithe the 10% and their finances are still a mess because they don't make good decisions with the other 90. And they don't, act, they don't have God's wisdom on how to spend the rest. And so I remember... <laughs> Years ago, decades ago, 
when Easy was continually rescuing some 19 or 20 year old uh, when, when we were first having Generation Jesus because uh, we even got a car donated to, to the ministry and one of our young men needed a car. So we go, well, let's give him the Suburban. So we had the Suburban, but we get a call from the University of Houston across town. Easy does. And it, Pastor Easy, my, my car is not running. I don't know what's going on. I just won't even, it just, something's wrong. And Easy goes, have you checked the oil lately, son? What? The oil. Where is it? And Easy was continually amazed and astonished that 19 and 20 and 21 year old boys didn't know where the oil was, had never even thought to check it. And so, but they were religious in their tithing. I mean, they would skip lunch so they could tithe, but they didn't know how to take care of anything they had. And so they weren't really good stewards, even though they were tithers. But you got to start somewhere, and so start at tithing, but there's a lot more to it. It's not just about giving, it's about living. And so you can have your finances in a mess because of how poorly you handle the 90. So you're a steward over your money. You're a steward over what you do and don't buy. Even when we can afford it, sometimes I'll go, God, do you want me to buy this? Am, am I supposed to have this? Is this going to really be worth it? Is this going to bring me joy? Is this going to last for a long time? Or is this just going to be a pain in the neck and I'm going to regret it? See, there was a time Easy and I were getting ready to buy a car, and we kept trying. We put a down payment on this car, and we go back, and they sold it to someone else. We're like, what's going on? And we found out later there was another plan entirely that God had for us concerning a car. So, see, sometimes we need to seek God even on things we can pay for because we are to be stewards, and we need to even submit to him how we handle the 90. And so, now, I know very... If, if you got this word ever in your life, you can raise your hand and you can come up and stand with me, actually. But I got a word from Ed Trout in 2007. People were there. And the word was, I was being too economical. Very few people can claim that, okay? I was being too economical, God said. And I was sacrificing too much and thinking that I had to, to pinch pennies to pay for everything. And God wasn't requiring that of me. And that I needed to feel free to spend more of our hard-earned money and not just save it. I was like, wow. But, you know, old habits are hard to break. <laughs> and so, you know, we moved into a new house. And Alan and John uh, convinced me that some of this stuff really needed to be replaced. So I'm like, okay, because I was willing to just live with the old stove and the, the old refrigerator and the old everything. And we replaced some things. I just felt like I was being super extravagant. But, you know, seven years later, when because of someone's deception, we found out that they had stolen our life savings, like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I wish I'd spent more of that money. I wish I'd listened to that word. It was gone. I could have, I could, we could have gone on vacation. We could have done a lot more stuff. So what would we do that year? I go, with what little we've got, let's go on a vacation. Finally, I'm like, let's spend some of it. So see, some people spend too much. Some people spend too little, and God sometimes is right in the middle. And if you will seek him, he will really try to get you in the place where you will have success for your life, and you can enjoy life. See, he's not a miser. He doesn't want you to just scrimp and save and never have anything to show for it, but he's also not wanting you to blow your money. There was a time when I saved and saved and saved. It was the early days of our marriage. Easy was still in debt from owning the hockey team and the tennis team and paying all the payroll taxes for these uh, expensive athletes that had million-dollar salaries, and... Um, we were saving and saving, and I wanted to buy a little breakfast room set. But a missionary came to our church and took up an offering, and God clearly said, give him the breakfast room money. Give him the breakfast room money. See, God will do things that you don't expect. He will do things that are not the way you're thinking. But if you're a steward, it's not about the way you think. It's about what he is saying. Now, how do you steward your possessions? How do you steward your home or your car? Do you do the required maintenance? If you don't, you'll end up with a huge repair bill. And then you'll go, God, help me out of this mess. And God goes, well, there's a way to steward things. There's a way to take care of things that makes more sense. And then on the other hand, a minister one time told me about a man in his congregation where, man, he was a giver, and God started blessing him and blessing him, and he loved God, and he was sowing, and, and, and then God kept blessing him, and with every new blessing, he'd buy something. And so first he bought a little beach house, and his family enjoyed that beach house. 
And then soon he bought a boat in another area, and they used it on the lake. And then he started bought golf clubs and took golf lessons. And, and then he, he had a timeshare somewhere else. And pretty soon he couldn't even come to church anymore because he was so busy with all the things that God blessed him with. And his relationship with God began to suffer. Now, I would like one of those, and maybe you would like one of those. But see, don't let your things get in the way of your relationship with God. They're not to be a detraction or a distraction. The, God makes one rich but adds no sorrow with it. I say it's pretty sorry when God gives you something and then you're not even around him anymore. See, something's wrong with that. Something's wrong with that equation. Now, God also wants to look out for you and the things that you take care of for him. Back in the 90s, we had, it's, it's hard to explain. If you've never seen it, I really should have a picture up there. It's a, it sounds dinky when I say it, but if you saw it, you would be amazed. But it was a portable soundstage, we'll call it that. And we lovingly called it the GJ Trailer. And people thought we had a spaceship going down the freeway when we were hauling that thing white with our Generation Jesus logo behind our white Suburban. And when you'd get to any location, you could unfold it, and it became a 16-foot by 16-foot. What is this, Alan? About, are, we, are we 16 this way? Yeah, we're 16 this way. So it was, it was this, this big and then a square that big, 16 by 16. The wiring for all the instruments and, and all the power was wired underneath. We had a generator to power it. We had huge speakers up on trusses. We had lights. And so you could put a band and preachers up there and have a service anywhere. In a park, we did it at the beach. You could do it in a parking lot. You know, we, we, we t took Jesus to the streets. And so we used this GJ trailer. Easy raised the money for it from a lot of his friends, and it was his brainchild. He had to get people to, he goes, no, this is how I see it. This is how I see it. And he saw it in his head, and he had people draw it. And the state of Texas said there had never been anything like it, and they had to do a special category for the tags on it. And, um, but after one of our stadium events, we decided we weren't going to do outreaches in the same way anymore. You know, we weren't going to do that thing where we had to make the rain go because we did that often so that rain wouldn't get on us. We had a canopy. But um, we decided it was time for us to sell the GJ trailer. We were expanding our sanctuary that we were in at the time. We were adding on to the children's room. We were sort of doubling our space that we had. And we needed money for the, the heating and the air conditioning on that new side. We needed money for the renovation. And um, we were going to sell the GJ trailer and use that money for the church. And I was like, oh, God, when are we going to sell it, though? You know, the construction guys, and we have some deadlines. And, and God spoke to me while I was reading the Bible at my kitchen table, and I just heard him say, you're going to sell it by March 29. And I'm like, whoa. And I'm like, am I just thinking this up? And I was reading the Bible, and I don't know what translation I was reading that even says March 29th, but I, I was flipping through some Bible, maybe it was Living, New Living, I don't know, and there was something about March 29th in it, and I'm like, oh my gosh, so I didn't want to make a fool of myself, so I told just a few people, and so, so sure enough, it's getting closer to March 29th, and you know, we have this, this, the words out that we're selling the trailer, and a lot of churches and people in the area knew about it, and um, we get a call from this unnamed denominational church that they wanted to buy the trailer. And sure enough, on March 29th, we were writing up a contract. And we were selling it for $39,500. Now, I looked it up, and in today's money, that would be $67,000, okay? We're selling it for what would be today the equivalent of $67,000. And this unnamed denominational church was going to pay for it in, like, was it five payments? Do you remember? Something like five payments? They wanted to pay for it instead of all at once, just you know, give them five months and they'd make monthly payments. And they were a lot more well off than we were. And, you know, they were good for it. And so we said, okay. But as we were writing the contract, I had a feeling. Now, see, when I say a feeling, I don't mean my emotions. I mean, I am sensing in the spirit something from God that I didn't put there. And I had a feeling, because around here, if you say that, you know, somebody goes, my feelings are hurt. Well, that's not so spiritual, all right? <laughs> I'm feeling like I'm mad at you. We're not talking about that kind of feeling. So I had a feeling that we needed to add a little addendum in that contract, a little paragraph, and just say, we will not be transferring the title to you until it's paid in full. And, um, but if, if any payment is more than 30 days in arrears, we will repossess the trailer until such time as payments are current. And I told Easy my little verbiage I wanted to add, and 
a few people in the office looked at me like, gosh, you're sort of cold, you know, like that's, that's sort of hard. And I'm like, I, I just feel we're supposed to put that. And they go, it's a church. And I go, I just think it's good business, but I have a feeling we're supposed to put that. So we put my little addendum in there. They signed the contract. We signed the contract. We delivered the trailer. They were using it in their men's outreach. And month one went fine, and month two went fine, and month three went fine until month four when they didn't pay. And then 30 days went by from month four, and they not only didn't pay, they wouldn't take my phone calls. And so I got out my contract and got my little addendum, and I got on the phone, and I asked to be connected to the pastor's voicemail, and I read my little addendum that talked about being more than 30 days in arrears and repossessing the trailer and that they didn't have the title, and we would be there to get it within 24 hours unless we heard from somebody. And sure enough, we heard from them, and we got that payment, and then the next. And so the moral, what's the moral of the story? Well, <laughs> God cares about what you steward for him. See, he didn't want us, our value to be diminished on our hard-earned work and donations that we had procured from people who trusted us. He didn't want that to be diminished or lost. Another moral is not all ministries have integrity. <laughs> and maybe that's why some people don't give and don't tithe. But see, just because somebody stole $650,000 from us, God told us, don't let it change you. Just because somebody was dishonest with you, don't let it change you. See, don't let it change how you operate with God because of what some person, some ministry, some minister did. And so we are stewards over our money, and we are stewards over our possessions. And God does care about adding value and not diminishing returns. But guess what? We're also stewards over our kids. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait. I brought them in, I can take them out. No. <laughs> but wait, what about while they're living here on this earth? <laughs> See, are you really raising them up in the way they should go? Are you raising them up in the way you think they should go, but you haven't asked God about it, and you don't care what God says because you didn't get to feel your ambition, and you want to live vicariously through them. And you're tired of being poor, and you're hoping they make money so they can give you some. Okay, what are you doing? Are you a steward? Are you trying to all of a sudden be an owner? See, <laughs> Easy told Paul Michael when he was 19, son, you'd make an awesome pilot. Well, and Paul Michael decided he wanted to be a professional party giver. He wanted to be a professional surfer. He went through 10 years of craziness, and at 29, he goes, can y'all give me some money? I want to go to pilot school. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, we had to let him find his way. And so... Raise your child up in the way they should go, not the way you think they should go, not the way you hope they should go. What is God saying? Have you taken time to listen to him? So we are stewards over our kids. We don't own them. And so we need to allow them to live the life God calls them to live, not hold them captive to our plans and our opinions. We're stewards over our employees. We don't own them. You know, I've treated different employees differently based on their particular emotional makeup, their particular bent and gifting. Because some people you have to be more gentle with. Some people you can be a little more rough with. Some people you can go, hey, Alicia, stop it. Okay, but, some, <laughs> but someone else you have to go, maybe we ought to do it this way. Because you'll, you'll bruise this one to say it that way. See, you are a steward. How would God want you to say it? There have been people I fussed at, and I said, if you're working for us, don't you dare talk to people like that, because we wouldn't talk to people like that. So if you're stewarding things for us, you need to do it with our heart. You need to do it with the way we would treat people, because we want, don't, want, don't want to project that. Now, we're also stewards over our talents and our gifts. 1 Peter 4.10, as each has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of God's manifold grace. And you go, well, I know God's given me a gift to do this, but, you know, uh, it takes a lot of time, and I'd, I'd rather go fishing. And well, You know, it, wait, it just said, as each has received a gift, use it. Use it to serve others. It's not about you. God gave it to you so you could serve others. So that, and you need to be a good steward of his grace to do that. We need to be stewards over our time accountable for our time. 
you know, I told you uh, last time I preached, I said, you know, a mom with five kids, she doesn't, you know, I'm, I have more time than she does. I decided with Easy, I don't have more time than she does. Okay, I, I think we're about equal. But the truth is, I've heard people tell me that they binge watch some sitcom for six hours. Or they binge watch Netflix for seven hours. But if church goes 15 minutes over, they are so antsy and so gripey. And so what is that about? You can sit there for seven hours and watch that, but church is 15 minutes over and you're nervous? Like, what? What? Now, if you think that's bad, let me just go ahead and go for it here. We are stewards over our health. Whoa. For everybody in the room who's got an aversion to exercise, for everybody who has a sweet tooth, let me be clear. It doesn't just affect your tooth. Okay, it's affecting more than your tooth, the sweet tooth. I mean, I tell Lizzie, please don't have ice cream in the house. You know how I am. Okay, like, do you love me? Don't buy ice cream. I can't resist it. But see, know what you, know what you need to stay away from. Because then you'll be here. You know, I got uh, diabetes and high blood pressure, and I've got this, and I've got that, and I've got, you know, my glycemic or something. And, I, and we'll go, have you considered changing what you eat? Have you considered exercising? And then there's these testimonies from non-saved people that will tell you they just lost 20 pounds and everything changed. Okay, we are stewards over our health. Some things we can't help. Some things come upon us. Sometimes even when we've done wrong things, God is so good and merciful. Like, did none of us is batting a thousand in this department. Not if you live in the United States, it's very difficult. Okay, to eat perfectly right, you know, to to exercise. Okay, Paul, do you wanna raise your hand back there? Okay. (laughs) I showed your picture to somebody. I said, he's on our worship team. He lives weights. He goes, boy, look at those thighs. Okay, in the the picture. All right, so. (laughs) But see, we are stewards over our health. And our body is a precious resource to God. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Our body is more important than this building to God. Our body is more important than the building. And so we need to steward it well and wisely. Divine health is better than divine healing any day because you don't have that in-between time when you're waiting to get healed. See, divine health. You know, some people go, I don't even have a testimony of divine healing. No, you're walking in divine health. That's better. To understand stewardship properly, you have to have an understanding of authority. Your life is not your own. Your body is not your own. See, now, we do this thing. We tend to commit things to God, but then we take them back. We take them back. Everyone in this room that's accepted Jesus, and if you haven't, we want to give you that opportunity You pray this prayer and you say, Lord Jesus, come, take control of the throne of my life. I give you my heart. I give you my life. And we pray that prayer and we mean it at that moment. But then we walk on and then it starts to look like we meant, well, at least just take me to heaven when I die. Help me when I say I want it and get me out of jams when I'm in a mess. But are we really giving him control? Or are we keeping it? Are we stewards or have we decided, oh, no, we're owners now. We're we're it. It's all about us. I'm in charge. See, the second year that Alicia and Dan worked here on staff, I think someone asked, what was it like working for Alan? Or, Or maybe they were being smart aleck and said, well, isn't Alan your boss? And Alicia said something like, well, he's not exactly our boss, but he's more like our general manager. And when I heard that, I laughed and I laughed. I laughed so hard. I love some of Alicia's one-liners. Because while she took orders from Alan in our absence, she knew he ultimately answered to someone else above him. Now, that was then. Now, when I call, I go, Alicia, can you do the... Well, Alan told me that I need to... And so, like, something shifted. Something shifted in the equation. The more I'm out of here, the more something shifted. Okay. And But let me be clear. When Alan first worked here... And we're talking decades ago, literally decades. No, Uh, uh uh-huh, he's too young. Um, Let me go back before he worked for us. He was in Arkansas, Hoxie, Arkansas. Is that right? Okay, he didn't want me to say Hoxie. Little Rock, we'll we'll make it Little Rock. Well, evangelistically speaking, Little Rock, Arkansas, it's near there. 
sort of, maybe. He worked for a grocery store, and he was, what, 19, 20 years old? And in that grocery store, he kept getting promotion after promotion after promotion. And finally, he was promoted at the young age of 20 to office manager where he was counting $100,000, and he was in charge of the money. He was in charge of the cashiers. He was in charge, like, that's a lot of responsibility for a 20-year-old. That's unusual. I mean, people in their 40s, you're their boss. But, but he evidently knew how to steward. And so then he moved here. And remember he told you he's the quiet person. Like, we, we never even knew what his voice sounded like. Well, after, when he finally started to talk, we knew it sounded a lot like Elvis. Okay, but <laughs> it has changed dramatically over the years. But um, I never heard him talk for like a year. But he worked at Sterling McCall Toyota. And, you know, down on the freeway. And he started, there was somebody else needed a job. I remember it. Oh, I hadn't thought of this story. You know who I'm talking about. Somebody else needed a job. And they go, they, what were they paying, $7.50 an hour to start, y'all? Yeah, $7.50 an hour. And the other person goes, I'm not working for $7.50 an hour. I need me a job that's making real money. Well, they never got a job. <laughs> like it, it was years. Alan went to work for $7.50 an hour, and then he got promoted, and then he got promoted again. Then he got promoted again, then he got promoted again. And after a couple years, he was the office manager at Sterling McCall Toyota over the cashiers, over the billing, over people way older than he was, over a lot of the big money stuff. I mean, that's a big production over there, Sterling McCall Toyota. It's no little hole-in-the-wall place. And so Alan was their office manager. So then he came to work for us. And I remember the first year I said, I will match your salary at Sterling McCall Toyota, but you're supposed to work here. And Dale Gentry has prophesied countless times over him. This is not the Alan commercial. But he said, uh, he said this man is faithful. You can trust him. See, and a lot of times we had suffered disappointment by various people, but God kept saying, this man is faithful. You can trust him. And see, what does 1 Corinthians 4.2 say about stewards? It says, will they be found faithful? Will they be found faithful? So Easy and I recognized quickly that even though Alan was very young, he had this knack for doing things just in the way that we wanted them to be done at church, in a way we respected. He seemed to have our same core values. And see, that's really what God expects of us. He wants us to do things the way he wants it done, with his core values, with his characteristics. And so I called Alan last night, and I said, Alan, were you just like us? Or, or how did that happen, you know, that you did all that stuff sort of? I mean, Alan has hardly ever gotten in trouble, all right, <laughs> over all these years. He's like a son to us. But, I mean, I can hardly remember fussing at him about much. Two things. All right, but anyway... <laughs> And I said, how did you do that? And he goes, well, I'm very observant, and I watched how y'all did things. I also listened to what you said, and I wanted to serve. I watched, I observed, I listened, and I wanted to serve. You can't do that without having a relationship with the person that you're stewarding for. You, you, that doesn't work. See, there's a relational aspect, getting to know their ways, getting to know their heart, getting to know their characteristics, getting to know their preferences, getting to know what's important to them, getting to know what they don't want done, getting to know what they disapprove of. See, that's what we need to be with God. See, you cannot steward well if you don't take time to know him, really know him, and he's the one you're stewarding for. The children of Israel, the Bible says, knew God's acts, but Moses knew his ways. So it's not some robotic, oh, i got to get this right. Okay, does this look religious? Uh, is my behavior right? It's not that. See, I'm going to be in trouble. God thinks this is wrong. It's not that. It's not bondage to learn God's ways. It's a fruit and a byproduct of relationship and intimacy. It it's, comes out of a desire to love and serve him, which is what we say we want to do. So with Alan, decades ago, first, we asked him to do certain things. Then later we saw that we could trust him, that he would do it right even when we weren't there. And then at one point we said, look, you have authority to do what you feel God is saying to you. You are not just coming alongside us stewarding this church. You are with us. You are stewarding with us, not just for us. 
Now, in the parable of the talents, the one who did as the master wanted was what? Given more. Matthew 25, 29. To he who has will more be given. He will have abundance. See, if you're faithful in little, the Bible principle is, you'll be entrusted with much. There's my word, stewarding abundance. Stewarding abundance, that's what God said when I woke up on December 18th, 2022, and he said, this is for next year. And then John said something in his sermon that day about abundance or stewarding, or, and I'm like, there's my confirmation. <laughs> but God keeps saying it. So how do we get there? How do we get to the place where we're actually stewarding in abundance? Number one, focus on what God values and cares about. It might surprise you. Sometimes the person that you want to get so mad at, he may go, just forgive them. Just be merciful there. Let it go. And sometimes you might not want to say anything. He goes, no, you need to address this. You need to go ahead and confront that and get it clear. See, God's ways might not be your ways. That's the point. Number two, rethink what stewardship actually means. It's not a stewardship program when they're hoping everybody double ties so that they can pay off their, their, where they're in debt. We are not in debt. We have never been in debt. We pay cash for everything, personally and for the church, and we raise money if we need something. Now, I believe that God wants us to be self-sufficient as a church, and it needs to come from in-house, and we need everybody fully tithing. Because if we're believing God for other things, just like John said, why are we afraid to trust him with our money? But rethink what stewardship actually means. And number three, in any area where you have not done so, start cultivating principles of stewardship. Well, what are those? Things like don't act on impulse. Get in tune with God first before making decisions, before blurting out what you're thinking. Don't get all religious about it. See, it's not a religious performance thing. It's a get close to him, and you'll get a sense of the direction he wants you to go. Sometimes he might even have to nudge you, but he'll do that. Be willing to do things in a way that's not your usual way of doing things. Be obedient even if it makes you feel like you are not in control. Because that's the point. You're not supposed to be in control. By doing these things, you will begin to not just cultivate, but actually operate in line with the characteristics of God. And they will not just be mm, unfamiliar or elusive to you, but they will become second nature. Isn't that what we're supposed to have in new nature? See, isn't that what the whole point? transformation to be more like Jesus, made into the image and likeness of God. A servant obeys. Nothing's wrong with being a servant, but a steward, a steward is entrusted, entrusted. I believe as a congregation, God is calling us higher. We've talked a lot about revival. I was looking through Easy's old notes, and I mean, he's been talking about this healing revival for years, and he's not going anywhere till we have it. Now, to sustain revival, you have to be able to steward it properly. To me, stewarding a revival is one of the highest responsibilities the Lord could give us as a church because it affects the eternal destinies of people. And more important, it's more important like than a house or a car or an outreach trailer. People, people are much more important than anything. A revival will affect their life on this earth when they get healed. When they get delivered, it'll change their family relationships. A difficult physical condition they've suffered with will no longer be their daily lot in life. See, when revival comes, people are changed. It's about people. So I'm asking God, teach us to be stewards, faithful stewards. Where do you start? Right where you are. But yet know that God is asking us as a church to come up higher. Stand to your feet with me. Father, I thank you for the people in this room. I thank you that you say that when we are faithful in little, you will give us much. Some in this room have been faithful with much. And Lord, I thank you that there's more. There's even more abundance for them. Lord, I thank you that there will be increase for every person under the sound of my voice. I think there will be increase in intimacy, in knowing you, in hearing from you, in knowing your heart. I think there will be an increase in obedience, God, that we will want to obey every word that proceeds out of your mouth. 
that there won't be that thing where I want it my way. We'll say, no, 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 not my way, not my will, but yours be done. And God, take me to that place. And if I'm unclear on what that means, show me more. Take back the veil, God. Let me see you. Let me see what you are doing, what you are saying, because that's what Jesus did. He said what he heard the Father say, and he did what he saw the Father do. And God, we want to be more like Jesus. We want to be faithful stewards. We want to be a church that's known for its stewardship. We want to be able to steward what you give us materially. And we want to be able to steward people well and wisely with love and grace, just like you. And we pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen.